Happy New Year. Happy New Sustainable Futures Report. I'm Anthony Day and it's Wednesday the 4th of January 2023. We still have a climate crisis and while I know there are many people who want to ignore and disbelieve that, there are many others who are determined to make the very best of things whatever the future holds. One of the major concerns of climate scientists and climate activists is the issue of food. Many are vegetarian or vegan simply because a vegetable diet makes more sense to them when you consider available resources. Towards the end of last year, global population passed 8 billion. 8,000 million people across the world. Every one of those has to be fed, and it is undeniable that vegetables deliver protein with far less inputs and land use than that required for producing the same amount of protein from livestock. Whether you're a vegetarian or a meat-eater, it's in everybody's interest that plants survive and thrive in the face of climate change, either to feed livestock or to feed people. That's why I was interested to learn of the work of the RIPE project. It's a project which has been ongoing for decades at sites in different parts of the world. Its aim is to adapt plants to the harsher future that climate change is creating. I was fortunate to be able to speak to Steve Long, project director. Steve Long holds the Eikenbury Endowed Chair of Plant Biology and Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois. He's also a distinguished professor of crop sciences at Lancaster University in the United Kingdom. He was named a Fellow of the Royal Society of London in 2013, and his work is published in more than 300 peer-reviewed journals, including Nature and Science. He's given briefings on food security and bioenergy to the US President, the Vatican, and to Bill Gates. He earned his bachelor's in agriculture from Reading University and his doctorate in plant sciences from Leeds University. He describes himself as a crop physiologist. Steve is director of the RIPE project at the University of Illinois, heading a multidisciplinary team with members across the United States, as well as in Australia and in the United Kingdom. Steve, welcome to the Sustainable Futures Report. Thank you. RIPE, R-I-P-E, Realising Increased Photosynthetic Efficiency. The FAO, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organisation, has said that by 2050, we're going to need 70% more food than we're producing now. And that's going to have to be achieved in the face of changing growing conditions brought about by climate change. How is the RIPE project going to help close that gap? The right project is looking at the process of photosynthesis. Directly or indirectly, all of our food comes through this process. If we look at the process um, thermodynamically, we can see that the potential is much higher than what we realize in our crops. Now, so what we're working on in the project is how can we alter the process, if you like, remove the bottlenecks to try and get closer to the theoretical efficiency. Now, why is this important for sustainability? If we are going to need to be producing more food, um, you know, as forecast by UNFAO, then there are two ways we can do that. One is to take yet more land into agriculture which is going to mean more destruction of natural habitat, um, you know, encroaching further into the Amazon, other forest regions, etc. Or we can try to produce more per unit hectare that's already in use. And that is how we see the right project benefiting this. I see. And you've been working on this for some years now. So how, how much progress? Where, where are you now? Well, we've obviously made a great deal more progress since we've had support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and also from the UK uh, um, 
UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office as well. Um, so what this has allowed us to do is to now test a number of ideas that were predicted from theory. And we've shown three different ones, which result in significant improvements in productivity in field settings, in agricultural settings. And the most recent one we've shown a quite substantial increase in soybean yield. In fact, on our farm here in Illinois, this resulted in a modern soybean cultivar, you know, in an over 20% increase in productivity. And what was particularly pleasing about that was that the quality of the seed, in particular the amount of protein and oil it contained, was not altered by that large increase. And so you're saying that you're maintaining the nutritional value, even though you're increasing the yield? Yes. And um, what I think is particularly important with in the case of soybean, and we hope with other legumes, is that a soybean here in Illinois is not normally fertilized. So it, it fixes its own nitrogen through association with Bradyrhizobia, nitrogen fixing bacteria in its nodules. So the only way we think we could have got this result without losing any protein content, yet having 20% more was that some of the extra product of photosynthesis was being fed to the nitrogen fixing bacteria to obtain that nitrogen. So there's a symbiosis between the plant and the surrounding bacteria. Yes. Yeah. And are you working with other crops? Uh, yes, we are. Um, we're particularly interested in cowpea, which is the most important vegetable protein source in sub-Saharan Africa, um, sometimes described as the poor man's meat um, for smallholder farmers. Um, and that, that, of course, is in collaboration with the, the Gates Foundation. We, we're also looking at a cassava and rice too. So this, your products uh, then will be available to the small farmer and not just to uh, the agricultural industry. Yes, that is the core reason for FCDO and the Gates Foundation supporting this work. So um, soybean is kind of a starting point. It is, it's an emerging crop in, in Africa um, because it does have such high yields, but relative to other legumes, but um, putting it into these crops, which are important to the smallholder farmer, is really most important because if you look today, at, you know, the, about one in 10 people on the planet are hungry, you know, for, subst for substantial periods. You could say that is arguably the worst global health problem we have. And when we look at where those hungry people are, um, the bulk of them are in South Asia, poor countries of South Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in many cases, these are actually farmers, ironically, they're smallholder farmers. And so, you know, we're looking in particular at crops that could really help them and ensure their own, if you like, family food security. And will the costs be such that these plants will be accessible to these small farmers? Yes, a condition, condition of the funding is that any technology developed, you know, whether patented or not, is available free of charge for in these countries. Right, well, I was going to ask you about that. Um, who owns the IP, the intellectual property? Uh, the intellectual property is, is owned by the inventors. So in the case of the example I gave you on soybean, that is jointly owned by the University of Illinois and UC Berkeley as well. Okay, so it's secure from that point of view. It's not, uh, it's not commercially owned, which uh, is, has been true of some um, uh, plant developments, I think. 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's available to small farmers in developing nations. Um, can they save seed or does it not breed true from saved seed? Uh, no, it would they, it would breed true from saved seed in, in the crops we're talking about in cowpea in cassava, which is vegetatively propagated. So they would be able to save seed. That, that's a very big advantage from their point of view, isn't it? Of course, if it was in corn, the, by far the best yields in corn come from hybrids. So they do have to be made by, you know, plant by a breeding company or, or breeding organization. It might be some countries that might be government held. Right. Uh, are you working on corn or do you have any plans to work on corn? Um, we, we think the technology we've used in soybean will work in corn. Uh, we haven't proved that yet, but, but we, we don't see any reason why not, because the processes we're improving um, are the same across a wide range of crops. Okay. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of uh, George Monbiot, the journalist. I don't know whether you've come across his latest book, Regenesis. No, I haven't. Sorry. Well, in that he quotes David Lobel from Stanford University. And if yes. I have interpreted uh, Lobel's paper correctly, he is saying that it is possible to re-engineer plants so that we do indeed see major increases in yield today. But that as climate, uh, as the climate crisis advances, then uh, we will just see yields falling back to where they are now. And given we've got a 70% um, gap, what's the answer? Um, well, that is, that is a huge challenge. And I think, you know, that is something sort of that's on our minds all the time. We are, we are, in this work, we are actively looking at, you know, how can we at the same time save more water? You know, we, we have in fact also developed a technology which we think will do that. We've also been looking at ways in which we might be able to allow the crop to maintain its production at higher temperatures as well. But, you know, that that is a a real issue of course the other one is we have to hope against hope that we do reduce our emissions in an urgent way so that climate change does not carry on on its current trajectory um you know we've i mean indeed we have actually shown one of our innovations in in soybean um it works better at high temperature but in fact you know, David is right that it, um, in this particular case, all we've managed to do is maintain yield by our innovation rather than lose it, which is what we would do if we hadn't made the change. Yeah. So, you know, this, this needs many more people working on it than, than just ourselves. Yeah. There are some who seriously uh, criticize industrialized agriculture on the basis it's plow it up, lace it with fertilizer, plant monocultures, spray pesticides, harvest and repeat. In fact, some people say we've only got 60 harvests left. And I heard somebody the other day say, no, we've only got seven left. I don't know. I think that's, well, I hope that's alarmist. Um, but do you think industrial agriculture is the future or can, will continue to be the future? Or should we be uh, concentrating more on the small farmer? Well, that is, you know, very much what we're thinking of, um, you know, and that, that is our target in this project because, you know, and, and we we have seen this before as well, that the world was facing serious starvation problems in the 50s and 60s, which were largely solved by the Green Revolution. Unfortunately, the approaches of the Green Revolution in you know, which was again improving the yield potential, genetic yield potential of crops. Unfortunately, those approaches are reaching their biological limits. So we need new ones, which is what we're doing now. But clearly, the, the aim, you know, of 
Gates Agricultural Innovations is to be able to give smallholder farmers seed, which will produce more um, and allow them to feed their, their families. Now, at the same time, um, you know, in if like countries with larger monoculture agriculture, United States, Brazil, Argentina, again, being able to produce more per unit land area is going to lower global prices, um, you know, which is very important. You know, as we've seen right now, you, you know, right now, of course, we're getting large increase in the price of wheat because not all of the Ukrainian Russian wheat is available as it would normally be. But we should keep in mind that it doesn't have to be a conflict that produces this situation. You know, a major drought in, in the US, in Ukraine or Russia would produce exactly the same effect. And, you know, we, we are seeing those, um, you know, one off events, extreme events occurring more and more commonly with climate change. All in all, then, are you optimistic for the future? Um, I, I'm optimistic in terms of the fact that we can produce the technologies. I'm far less optimistic about whether those technologies will be taken up in time, um, whether there's going to be enough effort made. I mean, the despite you know, all the efforts made by the, the Gates Foundation, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, that can only be a part of it. It needs a much bigger um, you know, input by nations to really, an attention to this problem. You know, UNFAO have been pointing out that since 2014, every year, more people are facing starvation and if we, you know, with, with the rising demand, you know, for example, if 70% is right, then this is just going to get worse and worse year by year. And of course, if, if large areas are, are suffering food shortages, as we saw in the Arab Spring, it can lead to civil disruption, civil wars, displacement of governments, which just exacerbates the situation. Um, so I know politicians have got many other things on their minds, but they need to also be looking at this major problem. So, so I, do, I do think that plant scientists can produce the technologies to address this, but it's going to take a massive investment to take it beyond that. Steve Long, thank you very much for sharing your ideas and thoughts with the Sustainable Futures Report. Thank you for your interest. So we clearly have the technology. Do we have the political will? That seems to be a perennial question in all aspects of sustainability. One we will no doubt return to. As you heard, the RIPE project is supported by the Gates Foundation, as well as the UK's Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office. There are links to both on the SFR website, which you'll no doubt remember is sustainablefutures.report. I think I mentioned a while ago that George Monbiot has published a book called Regenesis, and I've been promising you a review of it. I've written most of it, and then realised I'd lost my notes, so that I was going to have to go back and reread the book. Then I found my notes, so I haven't got quite so much work to do, but I haven't done it yet. The point is that George Monbiot is going one great step further forward. He sees the future of food in enormous fermentation vats. He believes that we will produce food by fermentation on an industrial scale, and that we can forget about ploughing the land and planting seeds and so on. I'll finish that review, so look out for it in February. And if you don't hear any more, please feel free to give me a nudge. Well, that's it for this week. I'm off to polish up my New Year's resolutions. Have you made all yours yet? Have you broken any of them yet? Hey, let's be positive. Yeah, that's my New Year's resolution. Let's be positive.
Let's be constructive, practical, pragmatic, and above all, helpful to others. Let's make 2023 a year with positive memories, regardless of whatever may happen. Next week, I'm looking at new technologies, or at least an adaptation of quite well-established technologies. Do you know how long it takes to charge up your phone? And how long it takes to charge up your electric car, unless you can find one of those ultra-rapid chargers? Even if you can, you'll find using an ultra-rapid charger is the most expensive way to charge your car. It's early days yet, but I do wonder how well batteries will stand up to high-capacity rapid charging. Wouldn't it be better just to swap the battery for a fully charged one, rather than waiting for it to charge? Next week's guest has an answer. Not for cars, perhaps, because they're just not designed to have their batteries removed, but there are certain other possibilities. Watch this space, or, to put it another way, don't miss the next episode of the Sustainable Futures Report on Wednesday the 11th of January. I'm Anthony Day. That was the first episode of the Sustainable Futures Report for 2023, the first of many episodes this year. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being a patron. I'm back next week. Thank you.